Merry Christmas Eve of Christmas Eve of July or something. I think I said it better there. Uh, I wanted to celebrate Christmas, so I'm going to do that. And you can join me for the next few minutes in celebrating Christmas. Uh, we're going to actually look at some gifts that God has given you as a believer in Christ to take uh, into your thoughts and mind and awareness as you go forward back to wherever it is you go. And then I also have a gift for you at the end of the session today. So it's only Christmas when we have gifts, right? Uh, at least um, the Grinch thought that and the Who's told them differently. But anyway, uh, on, to, on to the message. If you will go ahead and turn, please, to uh, 1 John. No surprise there. Oh, I was going to play this, so let's listen to a moment. That's the Tchaikovsky connection for this morning in light of the season. At least enough to get stuck in your head for the day, right? All right, so as we look at three gifts, I'm also going to look at three problems that we face that seem to be threatening to us sometimes as believers in Jesus. We'll find the problems in the scripture, but also find what God has given to sustain us. And that's our theme this morning, that God sustains us. God sustains you in your faith. So let's begin with uh, chapter 1, starting in verse 8, and I'll be reading through uh, chapter 2, verse 2. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sin, he who is faithful and just will forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar, and his word is not in us. My little children, I am writing these things that you do not sin, but if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. And he is the atoning sacrifice for our sins, and not only for ours, but also for the sins of the whole world. So obviously the problem here is sin. Um, Sin is simply disobeying God, not walking in accordance with God, not living according to the nature and the calling that God has given us. And it doesn't take long in life to become familiar with sin, right? So there's the problem. Now, I said past sin here because we're talking about I've done something or I have been involved in something or... There's something that is not right in me at this moment. What do I do about that as a believer? So God has given us the gift of confession. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves. That's not a good route. But if we confess, if we acknowledge, if we own up to the sin... We're told in the scripture here that God is faithful and God will forgive us. God has already provided. You know, we could say actually the gift is Christ, right? The gift is forgiveness also because when we do come with that confession, we also have assurance that God has provided what we need for a restart. It's kind of like when I play computer chess. One thing I like about computer chess is when I make a really dumb move, and then I see the consequence of that dumb move, I can go hit the back button and it's like I didn't make that move, I get to start that again, right? There's still some consequences in our lives, we still have to live through some things uh, as results of our actions, but with our relationship with God, there is a fresh start. God no longer holds that against me and I don't have to beat myself up for it, I don't have to go through a bunch of exercises to 
to gain forgiveness. There may be things I need to do to work in my own soul to change my attitudes and, and minds. But as far as my uh, freshness with my relationship with God, I confess it, I receive that forgiveness, I move on. It's a gift. Well, we've been talking about the world this week, so I'm going to go now to chapter 2, starting at verse 15. Another scripture here about the world. Do not love the world or the things in the world. The love of the Father is not in those who love the world. For all that is in the world, the desire of the flesh, the desire of the eyes, the pride in riches, comes not from the Father, but from the world. And the world and its desire are passing. I love that. We talked about that already this week. They're passing away, but those who do the will of God live forever. So unpacking the world a little more, John tells us here that there are three things that the world has that will entice us into living in different ways than God has given and called us to live. There are three ways that we can easily be tempted. And it's interesting that these three things run as a theme uh, throughout Scripture. They don't uh, just get their origin or our first mention here. Uh, for example, in Genesis 3.6, the temptation that's depicted there, uh, Eve uh, sees the fruit and sees that it would be, it would be good, right? Like this would, would be good uh, to eat. It's beautiful. And it's desirable to make one wise. Fast forward to uh, Jesus. Uh, actually, in all three of the uh, other, of Matthew, Mark, and Luke, uh, we find out about Jesus' temptation. Um, I'm going to pull from Matthew 4, uh, 1 through 11 is, is my context, but, uh, but the story is, is told in, in those other Gospels as well. Uh, Jesus is led into the desert, and Jesus is tempted by Satan in the desert. First temptation... These stones, by the way, Jesus has been fasting, right? Jesus fasts for 40 days. These stones, turn them into bread and eat, you're hungry. Jesus says, we shall not live by bread alone. The next one, oh, so, so bread, right? What is bread? Bread is less of the flesh. Is it wrong to eat? No, of course it's not wrong to eat. But that was not the context. Jesus was fasting. This was not the time and the place. So many times it's not when we're talking about our, our fleshly desires, it's not this is a bad thing. It's this is not the proper place and time. This is, this is excess, right? This is something that uh, is outside of what God has intended this for. So that was not the time uh, to eat when Jesus had consecrated himself for a fast. Um, and you can take that into many different things to say, you know, I have... Things that I, you know, if, I, if I'm eating all the time, then eating becomes the problem, right? But not within the right context. So we learn to live in a way that is, is disciplined. Um, well, what's next for Jesus? Look, look, see all the kingdoms of the world. They could be yours. Wait a minute, wait a minute. Jesus is the king of kings. But at that moment... Jesus had laid down his rights and his role, and that was not the way to all the kingdoms of the world. Lust of the eyes, pride of life, show off, jump off of the temple, the angels will catch you. So Jesus overcame these temptations. We are given temptations, and we know that Jesus already overcame um, but there is a gift mentioned in 1 John. It is called here God's seed. So to reference this, we're going to chapter 3, starting at verse 8. Everyone who commits sin is a child of the devil, for the devil has been sinning from the beginning. The Son of God was not revealed, uh, I'm sorry, the Son of God 
was revealed for this purpose, to destroy the works of the devil. Those who have been born of God do not sin because God's seed, there it is, abides in them. They cannot sin because they have been born of God. The children of God and the children of the devil are revealed in this way, that all do, who do not do what is right are not from God, nor are those who do not love their brothers and sisters. So we see that love theme right back. Well, an interesting question, what is God's seed? And John does not elaborate on that. Some have said, well, it's the word of God. What good reason for that? Um, for example, Psalm 119.11, I have hidden your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. So if that makes sense. Um, but it's, again, not specifically stated here. And what we do have here is that it is something that has come in with the new birth. Something that God has put in us. Uh, so those who have been born of God do not sin. Something that God puts within us. You could still say the word because if you think about uh, Jesus' parable of the sower, for example, in Matthew 13, the word is sown. That will have to do with people coming to faith. And in every way I want to say, stay in the word. Sow the word in your life. Whether that's the reference here or not, very important. Um, but I, I think for our sake today, we can just simply say, it is what God has planted in you. When you come to Christ, the work of God in you is the seed which will grow and will bear fruit and will make you, uh, you know, productive in your life in Christ. But something about the seed keeps you from sin, which gives a second concern that someone might have. It shows actually the need for, for serious study of Scripture. I'm sure many Christians have read this verse and thought, oh no, I am in trouble because it seems to clearly say that if you sin, you're of the devil, you are not, uh, you're not a Christian. That seems to be what it says here. A Christian cannot sin. Well, okay, then we're done, right? I'm, I'm going home if that's the case because that would certainly not be my experience. We know that isn't the case of what John is saying for one reason because we just dealt with the fact that John said, if you sin, Here's the, here's the gift. Here's the solution. Confess your sin. And, and John said, if you say you have no sin, you're a liar. So wait, he, John cannot be saying here that it is impossible uh, for a Christian to sin or that you are not a Christian if you sin. In fact, this is a gift. We need to turn our thinking around the other way. The idea here is that you cannot continually go forward in known sin because you will be very uncomfortable with that. So if you get to the place where you're worried, oh, I've completely blown it, it's, it's probably uh, a good sign that you are concerned because there's something about that that you're not happy or comfortable with. I would be concerned when someone is saying, oh, I love Jesus, and then they are going right on doing something they absolutely know is not God's will, and they do it anyway with, ah, who cares? Now, that would be a concern, but they're not concerned. They're going on doing it. Um, when you have the work of God in your life, you have an uncomfortability. There will be, it will bother you. You will not be satisfied with it. And so there's a confidence that you have. As we go about life, we are out doing things in the world. This, you know, We're not told never enjoy life. Go find yourself a... A desert island and, you know, cocoon yourself in, right? But we're given a gift that we have a confidence that there is no temptation that we're going to face that God's grace is not sufficient. So think about this. God's given us the grace to walk in the world, do the things he's called us to do, enjoy life, and know that God will be faithful to sustain us. And if we do sin, we have confession as a gift. So it gives us such a confidence. Take it as a gift. It's not something you have to go do to get. God put it in you, 
And so you can be confident it's there. Isn't that wonderful? Love the Lord. Well, what about deception? So this gets to be the juicy part today. Yeah, we get to talk about the Antichrist. <laughs> it gets a subject that gets a lot of attention. Now, here's the interesting thing. Antichrist is only mentioned in two books of the Bible, 1 and 2 John, only mentioned four times. So when I say Antichrist, if people connect Antichrist to some other characters in Scripture, and those are interesting connections, but I'm not going there today, sorry. Um, I'm sticking with what we have here in 1 John. So I'm starting in 2.18. Children, it is the last hour, as you have heard. By the way, it was the last hour then, and we're still in the same last hour. This is post-first coming of Christ. Okay? Um, more could be said there, but that's enough for this morning. Uh, you've heard that Antichrist is coming. So, an Antichrist, what singular, right? Uh, so now, many Antichrists have come. From this we know it is the last hour. They went out from us, but they did not belong to us. For if they had belonged to us, they would have remained with us. But by going out, they made it plain that none of them belongs to us. But you have been anointed by the Holy One, uh, and all of you have knowledge. I write this to you not because you do not know the truth, but because you know it, and you know that no lie comes from the truth. I'm going to skip down to verse 27 then. As for you, the anointing that you have received from him abides in you so that you do not need anyone to teach you. But as his anointing teaches you about all things and is true and is not a lie, and just as it has taught you, abide in him. All right, so what can we say about the Antichrist here? We can say that they are deceivers. We can say that they are the same folks we've been talking about here that were in the community and left. In this case, but John says many antichrists have gone into the world. So these aren't the only ones. These are just some of them. Um, they deny who Jesus is. Uh, so then we go back to the wonderful doctrine we've been mentioning several uh, times where Jesus is fully God and fully man. We call that the... I heard an incarnation, thank you. Very important. In fact, there's another place that I won't go to this morning in 1 John that he gives a test to say, well, how do we know? How do we discern? And it comes down to who Jesus is. That's very, very important. But in context here, deception could be a problem, right? I mean, these folks were even here among us. They were teaching something that is contrary to who Jesus is, and they left. Now, John's talking to the community who did not leave. These are the ones who are still there and faithful. And the gift is the anointing. The anointing is simply the ministry of the Holy Spirit. So if you ever think, hmm, what does the Holy Spirit do in my life? There are many things. That could be... a a wonderfully long study, but this morning, here's one. The Holy Spirit is a teacher for you. Now, when John says you don't need anyone to teach you, he's clearly not saying we don't have teachers in the church or there's no place for Bible teaching because he's doing that, right? John is teaching. The idea here is that the Holy Spirit will preserve your confession of Christ. The Holy Spirit will guide you to know what is, is true because there are many teachers. Which teachers do I follow? Right? I mean, that, that, that becomes an issue to say, well, if, if we're relying on human teachers, well, which ones? Because they disagree sometimes. This isn't getting down to saying also that there are not disagreements among genuine Christian folks. There certainly are. But there are some things that are essential there are some things that are essential to maintain authentic faith, like we're talking about this week. And one of those things, very central, is the identity of who Jesus is. The Holy Spirit will preserve 
your relationship and understanding and testimony and will guide you as you seek to study the word, as you seek to understand. We don't get this on our own in the little brain that fits in this shell. It's one of the, I'm a college professor, I love education. But one of the biggest things that I want to convey to people is, you are not intelligent enough to figure out the whole world. In fact, the more education you get, the more you probably know, oh, there's so much I don't know. There's so much we don't know. And knowledge and, and learning have a, a huge place. They're very important. But they can't get us through everything. We need help from the Creator to know the things that are essential. And so the gift is that God gives us that kind of knowing when we are believers in Christ and when we seek the Lord God abundantly gives us the kinds of wisdom that we need. So there are gifts. Enjoy the gifts. Merry Christmas. Last thing I want to do is go to the last verse, the epilogue. This is my second favorite ending of any book in the Bible. It's my second favorite ending just because it seems a bit random. Now, we'll find out that, you know, maybe it's not so random. But little children, keep yourself from idols. I mean, it seems like it's got nothing to do with anything that's been going on in the book. And just suddenly, oh, and keep yourself from idols. By the way, no idols. My favorite seemingly random scripture is the end of Jonah. So if anyone knows it, God, what is it? And much cattle? <laughs> yes, coming at you. Oh, sorry. Thank you. Oh, that was good. Yeah. And much cattle. Love it. Um, yeah, but, but what about here? Little children, keep yourself from idols. This would be very random, I think, in my understanding, if John were talking about simply things out of wood and stone that people carved and put in temples and bowed to. He hasn't been dis discussing that at all. And now there, there were religions that used those things uh, that would not have been uh, too far removed from John's place and time here, so that could be the case. But if we put in context everything we've been talking about, I think we need a larger definition of idols, and certainly we do in our life. Oh, I think I have one there. What's your definition? Oh, I thought, yeah, I thought I had a hand raised up there. <laughs> okay. Um, an idol is simply anything that you put in place of God, period. So it can be anything. Because if you put it in, in the place that God belongs, it now is an idol. It can be physical. It can be habits and things we do. Um, so think about this. How do you spend your time? Now, does that mean you spend all of your time reading the Bible? No. But we gear our time under God. We need time to rest. We need time to have fun. Those are all wonderful and proper and good. But if something starts consuming your time in a way that distracts your life from God's purposes and you're not willing to do something about it, boom, you got idle, right? Um, how you spend your money. Again, you could become very legalistic about this, but the whole idea is your money comes under the lordship of Christ. So you think about your money in ways that would honor God. Uh, there's many ways that that works. What do I need? What's helpful? What's going to be beneficial? Sure, you can have fun. You know, those, are, those are all proper. I even think his discipleship issues into... Um, choices I'm making as far as, as companies and, and their fairness and all of this. But the idea is, you know, you can go into a million things. My point isn't to go into those things. My point is to think as a Christian. Think as a Christian. And when you start saying, you know, I'm not sure that's the right thing, but I'm going to do it because I just like it, then it becomes more important than God. So you let God teach you. You, you let the scriptures instruct you. You, you learn 
and then you use the things of the world in ways that are appropriate under the lordship of Jesus. Um, and, and so we could go on and on and on. You know, uh, social media, I mean, we could name a million things, but again, it can really be anything. As long as Christ is Lord of your life, you don't have idols. Because if something else is coming out of place and you become aware of that, and you say, oh, okay, I, let me fix that. Let me get this in proper place. If I see it's becoming something too large in my life, I, I confess it and move into what would be right. If I'm not willing to do that, then I give this a place that it doesn't belong. It can even be people and people groups, right? This person's opinion now matters more to me than God's. I want to be in the crowd so much that I will do this even though I'm not comfortable or I know that this is not in keeping with my Christian faith. That crowd just became an idol. John says, keep yourself from idols. Well, how do I do that? I keep God as God. Now, how does that connect to everything we just said? Because God has given you everything you need for life and godliness. God will sustain you. You don't have to walk in fear. You can walk in confidence that God is keeping and sustaining and taking care of and, and promoting you to the things that God wants for you. You can have this full assurance and this full trust and a joy in God. But if you decide something else is God, now you are cutting off or limiting the work that God desires to do in your life. So this becomes a paramount thing that to have the full benefits, consistently working the way that they need to work in my life, I need to keep God as God. Well, how do I do that? Well, there are some disciplines that help. And we need to be careful when we talk about spiritual disciplines because they are not things to earn salvation. They are not things to make God like you more. They are things to keep our soul and our minds and our hearts rightly connected, give God the place that God wants to work and teach and help and refresh and do all of those wonderful things God wants to do in our lives. We need to make space. So I have a gift for you in parting today. I will have them distributed in just a moment before we leave chapel. Um, but I figured it would be easier to put something up here because the students, you know, if I gave it out before, everyone's, oh, what's this? You know? um, this is a little uh, daily prayer and devotion resource. It is just that. It's a resource. It's not the way to do something. It is... Uh, it has ways to do things that will be beneficial to you. One of the things it has is uh, a set of prayers and practices for morning, midday, and evening. And maybe you would just choose one of those. You don't have to start with all three, obviously. Um, many of the prayers in here, there are written prayers. Many of them are quite old, which gives me some assurance. These are things that Christians have been praying for uh, many years, even centuries in some cases, and, and, and we've tried them and found them to be beneficial and true. And so I'm not against written prayers. It does not stop spontaneity of also just praying your own prayer. You would find in here, oh, there's times to just pray for mom, okay? Um, but there are some written prayers. This helps my mind because my mind likes to wander and I easily get focused on whatever's concerning me most today. And so it helps to step back and say, oh, these are things also that I should be praying about and things that uh, inform my soul as far as remembering who God is in my prayer. But there are also some practices, as I mentioned. And even if you didn't use the written prayers, just looking over and seeing those practices, reflect, remember, pray. Um, these practices are very helpful and necessary when we take that time out to be with God. So, so those are woven in. This, most of this was actually compiled by a pastor at the church I attend um, who said, yes, freely use it because this isn't even stuff that that pastor wrote. Uh, these are just things that are compiled that Christians, again, have been using uh, most of them for, for a very, very long time. I find here that the Bible project I referenced earlier in the week is listed, so for your deeper study, 
you need to be reading scripture. It's a very important discipline. Uh, a little deeper study in scripture, that would help you. This doesn't have a scripture guide, but there are tons of scripture guides out there. Um, so finding a way to know, for me, again, finding a way to know what I'm going to read, something uh, systematic that takes me through uh, multiple parts of the word of God, very important. So anyway, as you formulate that, or as you continue to formulate your walk and your devotion time, this may be of help to you. Uh, so I just share it for that purpose. Um, one other thing I'll say, some people think if something's a little too structured that it becomes just a checklist and that can be problematic. And I would just say this, yes, if what we mean is it becomes just stiff and I don't have any room to just relate to God, that would be a problem. On the other hand, checklists for me are extraordinarily important. If I don't have get gas on the checklist, we're probably not going somewhere. Um, this week, I did not carry around a checklist, and I needed to get money from Wawa when I went to get snacks or something. I needed money for laundry. And right now, I'm on about the last of my laundry, so I'll be taking up an offering in just a moment. <laughs> um, you know, checklists help us. So if you have God on your checklist, right, if you have your time with God on your checklist, that's not a bad thing because it might mean it, it gets done. And sometimes just getting there is the, the most important step. It doesn't have to be an amazing moment every time in your mind, but it's consistent and you are allowing God to be God in your life by your actions and disciplines. So, I'm going to have someone distribute them. I'm noticing here that the first couple copies were blank on the inside, which would be very disappointing, so I'm taking those out. Uh, but then I will get someone to distribute them. It is my gift. I would like to close uh, as we uh, end today with a prayer that is found in here. It's actually a prayer that I'm uh, familiar with praying most mornings, and it will give us a good start to today. Lord God Almighty and Everlasting Father, you have brought us in safely to this new day. Preserve us with your mighty power that we may not fall into sin nor be overcome by adversity. And in all things we do, direct us in the fulfilling of your purpose through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen and amen. Be blessed. Have a great final full day at Shehi. I have been so blessed to get to share with you this week. Amen.